Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. As promised on Patreon, I'm going to do more of these short videos on interesting millimeter wave or microwave components. And here I have something else for you guys. So this doesn't look like much, but when it was originally purchased, I think we might have paid about seven and a half thousand US dollars for this. It's come down in price, but not by much. If you look at this, it has three ports. You can see a coaxial connector in the front. This is a 2.92 millimeter or K connector. I have a video on all kinds of microwave connectors that you can watch on the channel. Now, by knowing that this is 2.92 millimeter, it means that it can support up to 40 gigahertz of signal. So it's a fairly high frequency port even on this one. And then there's a waveguide port right here and a waveguide port right here. So this actually operates from 75 to 110 gigahertz. Now you already probably have guessed what it is. You flip it on the other side, you can see that the ports are labeled. So this is indeed a mixer. It's a, double, it's a balanced mixer and it has an IF port with a very, very high frequency support. Now, because this is 75 to 110 gigahertz, these waveguide ports must be WR10s. We can measure them to actually verify they are WR10s. This is a dimension issue, of course. And you can see that we might be able to take it apart a little bit and see how this is put together. Now, these things are usually built to order, and but now they're much more common nowadays, so you probably can just buy them off the shelf. We'll take a look at what kind of specifications something like this could have. Now, this is a mixer that operates on fundamental frequency of the LO. As a result, it has a very good noise figure, relatively speaking, good noise figure, and can provide a good conversion gain. Of course, it has conversion loss, but it's not that bad. So let's take a look at some of, some of its specification, and then we can take it apart and see what it looks like on the inside. I'm particularly interested in seeing how they transition from the waveguide into what's in here. So I know that this is a Schottky barrier diode in there. That's how they do the mixing. So it should be pretty cool to look at it under the microscope. So let's verify that this is indeed a WR10 waveguide interface. And the way to do this is that you have to measure in inches. And everything after the decimal point represents the WR number, the waveguide number. So let's see what we have here. I'm measuring this one. Yeah, check it out. There it is. Indeed, WR10. And this is a standard. That's how the naming convention goes. And of course, with waveguide, you can calculate exactly the cutoff frequency of the waveguide by its rectangular dimension. It's a very simple mathematical relationship. It's based on EM theory, of course. If you look carefully, you can see there's a very faint line here. That's because this piece, this is made of two pieces screwed together. And that's what these four screws over here are underneath the main waveguide screws. That's how this piece is held together. But the precision of the machining is so incredibly high, uh, good, that you can barely see this interface. Now, any gap or any roughness or any misalignment here severely degrades the quality of the waveguide. And stuff will leak out, especially because at these dimensions, every micron essentially matters in terms of the loss and, loss and everything can escape through this. So pretty important to have precision machining, and that's one of the reasons why these things are expensive and become more and more expensive as the waveguide becomes smaller. Now, I can't find the exact data sheet of this part because it's so old, but it's going to be roughly similar to the ones over here. So let's take a look here. We have a WR10 version, this one, and you can see that it has a 2.92 millimeter IF connector, just like we saw. And it supports an IF bandwidth up to 35 gigahertz, which is really high. But this is very advantageous because it allows you to place your IF at a frequency that matches the rest of the system and perhaps avoiding some kind of images of these mixers because, again, these are not image reject, reject mixers, they're just simple balanced mixers. Now, the LO frequency and the IF frequency can be anywhere from 75 to 110 gigahertz, and, of course, that means that a certain IF will land at a particular frequency. Now, they do have reasonably good conversion loss. And uh, the LO requirements is 13 dBm, so the LO is at the same frequency at the RF or very close to it. We're looking at some um, a loss of about 6.5 dB or 9 dB or so. That noise figure is about 3 dB less than that. So it's pretty good. And these things can have a very good high, high dynamic range for various needs. The disadvantage of this is that you still need to generate an LO signal up to 13 dBm to force it into this to create the nonlinearity in the Schottky diode. And normally these are coupled with active multiplier chains, so that you start from a much lower frequency, maybe a sixth of it, you multiply that out, amplify it, and then you get your LO, and then you put the LO in there, and you still have conversion loss after that. So you may want to add an IF amplifier to boost everything back up. So this is how typically these systems are used. So what I'm interested in is seeing those interfaces, like I talked about, and how they go from the waveguide into the Schottky diode. You should be able to at least see that in there. So let's see if there's a plot here. I think there's a conversion loss plot. Where is the one up to 110? There you go. Here it is. Yeah, that's not bad. Look at that. So at the very high frequency at the end towards 110 gigahertz, 
if you have a LO of 13 dBm, you can see the loss starts to go up. It's interesting that they stop these other two plots when the LO is 15 and 17 dBm. I suspect that's because whatever they were using to measure it probably couldn't keep up uh, produce an LO of 15 to 17 dBm or so. Uh, you can see that it keeps getting further and back. So at 100 gigahertz, they couldn't generate an LO above 17 dBm. That's probably why the plot stops. But yeah, not too bad. That's not very sensitive to the LO power, which is good. That's what you're looking for. But you need a minimum of 13 dBm. There you go. And this is an IF of 1 gigahertz. So let's go ahead and see what it looks like. I'm eager to take it apart. And here we are. Here's the two, two halves that I separated from each other. And look how cool it is. So when you connect them together, like this, that's how the waveguide interface was, like we saw earlier. So the two halves of the waveguide separate over here. And look at the transitions, how they thin out the waveguide opening into a tiny point to reach the diode. The diode must be right there. It's absolutely tiny. There's also something else over here, which is hard to see. We're going to have to look at it under the microscope. We can very clearly see the transitions and the absolute precision that is required to machine this out. And even this one, you can even see this is not even straight. Wow, very, very cool. And that's the other end for the IF port. There's the IF port you can see in the top left. Yeah, we're going to have to look at this under the microscope. Very nice. So let's take a look and see how this works, because it is both simultaneously simple and complex at the same time. So at the heart of it, we have our two diodes. These are the Schottky barrier diodes. There's one right over here, and there's one over here. These are really, really small, of course. We're looking at a magnification of 50 here. So we have three ports, an IF port, an LO port, and an RF port. And all of these guys have to act upon these diodes at the same time. This is a balanced mixer. So it looks to me like this cavity over here, this is the waveguide transition from the LO side. Look at how interestingly they terminate that over here. This probably couples onto this line. So that's the coaxial transition from the LO side that excites the center between the two diodes. And at the same time, the IF is generated in coax mode already, and that goes left out of the 2.92 millimeter connector. So the LO and the IF board are briefly shared only over here, and the transition goes in this direction. Now from the other side, we have the RF signal coming in, and that comes through this waveguide piece, and that couples into this part and that part, and that's how I believe it transitions into the other two ends of the diode and therefore making the balance structure. It, these are really, really small pieces, of course. And I can focus at the bottom of this waveguide port. So you can see the bottom of it. There it is. I guess it's a bit scratched up. There you go. So let's focus back on the top once again so we can see the diodes. And I can move to the other side so you can see where the RF port comes in. Here's the RF port. It gets wider and wider until it hits the WR10 width. There it is. And then it comes back and transitions into the coaxial mode of those diodes. It's pretty interesting. Now we can go on the opposite side of this, that the other piece that sits on top, and it's exactly the mirror image of this. So let me get to that. And then you can see how that's done. It's basically exactly the same. There we go. So what you're looking at here again is the LO port. So now you don't see the pin sticking out. And then this little piece over here, this black piece, that's just an RF absorber, preventing any you know, particular cavity modes of being excited. I'm trying to find out where it's focused, how to focus on it. It's sitting somewhere in the middle. It's difficult to capture it because it's so dark. But yeah, there's this exact same points on these two ends as well, the same cavity part there, that, that, that accomplishes the transition from the RF onto the diodes. It's really neat. I mean, it's very simple. It's a lot of precision work and a lot of EM modeling to achieve that. So let me go back here so we can see the diodes again. Yeah, so this has been damaged, probably either because of some weird ESD event, even though everything's really nicely grounded. Most likely uh, somebody touched this port from the outside and maybe had some ESD event under because it's floating with respect to everything else, and it probably destroyed these diodes. So it was still working, but it had a conversion loss of like 30 or 35 dB. So basically, it was dead. Yeah, so hopefully you learned something. I certainly really enjoyed looking at it. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick video of the 75 to 110 gigahertz down convert mixer. As always, thanks to my Patreon supporters. And if you get a moment, please take a look at the page and see what kind of stuff I plan to do in the future. And your support is always appreciated. See you next time.